Great. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Research Ethics and Policy Series. Thank you to all of you in the room here today. Um, and we're also glad to have those of you who are joining us online. My name is Holly Fernandez Lynch. I'm an assistant professor of medical ethics in the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy here at Penn. And I am the REPS co chair along with Steve Joffe. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Jonathan Jackson for his talk titled Belmont's Third Pillar Toward Justice in Clinical Research. I'm gonna introduce you in just a moment, but let me make a couple of quick announcements first. Most important, um, Dr. Jackson will be delivering another talk tomorrow at noon on the challenge of quantifiable research representation. Mary will go ahead and post um, the registration information for that in the chat. Um, if you're in person, you can find out more um, about that event on the events page um, on our department's website. And that event will also um, be virtual and in person. Um, in person, we'll be back in this room tomorrow at noon. So we hope you'll join us for that totally different talk. We are recording this session. Um, and when it's ready, we will post the video to the Medical Ethics and Health Policy website. We are going to continue hosting reps in this hybrid fashion for the foreseeable future. So please join us in person if you can, join us remotely um, if, if you need to do that. This is our last lecture of the spring term. We take a quick summer hiatus over um, July and August, and then we'll be back on September 12th. Um, that's accounting for the Labor Day holiday. Um, and we'll have a special lecture by Ulf Schmidt on medicine research and the Holocaust. Um, as you can see, we are already scheduling um, lectures into 2023, um, but we would love to hear from you if there's somebody that you would like us to invite um, to this series especially individuals from diverse backgrounds or who would contribute diverse perspectives to issues that are relevant to research ethics and policy. Um, a quick reminder, if I can get this to me. Um, you can use the keyboard. Um, okay, um, a quick reminder about some online resources from our department. We have a series of short research ethics training courses that are available for free. Um, and you can get continuing education credit for those. Some of these um, short training courses can also be used to satisfy research ethics training requirements at Penn and CHOP. All the information about those is on that website. And then I, of course, want to thank our co-sponsors shown here, all of whom who helped make reps possible. And a special thank you to Karen Glantz and the Abramson Cancer Control Program <laughs> Um, for prov providing additional support for events today and tomorrow. And of course, thank you to Mary for her always excellent work administering the series. Okay, so a, a brief introduction of today's lecturer. Dr. Jonathan Jackson is the Executive Director of the Community Access Recruitment and Engagement or CARE Research Center at Mass General Hospital. And he's an Assistant Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. The CARE Center investigates the impact of diversity and inclusion on the quality of human subjects research and leverages deep community entrenchment to build trust and overcome barriers to clinical trial participation. Dr. Jackson's research focuses on inequities in clinical settings that affect underserved populations, and he's received a variety of funding for this work, including a prestigious NIH Pioneer Award. Dr. Jackson is trained in psychological and brain sciences and also conducts research as a cognitive neuroscien neuroscientist, investigating the early detection of Alzheimer's disease. He's become a well-known representative to underserved communities and dozens of affiliated or organizations, especially regarding participation in research. We are really looking forward to learning from you today. Um, just a word about how we'll handle the, um, the questions and discussion. When Dr. Jackson is um, finished with his lecture, I'll ask for questions in the room. I'm also signed on to the Zoom, so we'll go back and forth. If you are on Zoom and have a question, please put it in chat at any time um, during the lecture and I will read it out when that time comes. All right, take it away. Thank you so much, Holly. And uh, thank you so much to the University of Pennsylvania um, in its various iterations that have made it possible for me to, to be here today. Um, this is my first in-person uh, lecture in probably probably a little over two years at this point. So uh, I'm a little rusty, I'm a little nervous. So uh, I want you all just to bear with me. 
Uh, I've got some big ideas, but this is sort of like the difference between singing in the shower and being on American <laughs> Idol. So um, uh, here's, here's hoping that um, uh, this actually makes sense to, to all of you, but hopefully there will be a nice robust discussion period either in the room or on the Zoom uh, so that we can talk about these ideas um, of, of re with regard to Belmont's third pillar. Um, you know, I think we all know the expression, follow the money. I wanted to provide a more detailed disclosure statement here uh, to talk about where my paychecks come from. Uh, so currently are supported by grants from the National Institute on Aging and the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Uh, we do have some community activities that are supported um, via grants and prizes. Uh, and then previously we, we have had some uh, relationships with pharma, but all of those dollars went right back into the communities. Um, they didn't stay within the research center at all. Um, I wanted to start with this quote. I've given uh, various talks um, on this topic over the years, um, but this quote is always timely and it is always true. Um, of all forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhuman. Uh, in 1965, Martin Luther King Jr. delivered these words to a huge crowd in Montgomery, Alabama, after a long, violent, and exhausting uh, march from Selma. At the time, he really was uh, referring to contemporary issues around uh, health, and race, but he was also giving voice to concerns around medical abuses against the black community past and present. Um, there have been so many analyses uh, over the years and over the decades that have shown that the same disparities uh, that rule the day in our halls of justice and our halls of learning uh, apply equally, not more so, in our halls of healing. Um, we have to recognize uh, that more black Americans are killed in a month from health inequities in a single disease, diabetes, then police brutality kills in a year. And that's not an exaggeration. I did the data myself here, the calculations. Um, and this isn't even the total number of black deaths from diabetes, just the excess number of deaths. Uh, if you match the mortality rate between black and white Americans, you divide by 12. Uh, every month, every single month, we lose hundreds of black lives at more than double the rate of whites to a single disease. Just one, this should be an outrage. Look at this. We should be furious, especially seeing that huge spike in 2020 that is yet to go away. But too often we remain really quiet about this. And um, unfortunately, this is the kind of cost that we're paying for our silence. And we know that one in 225 blacks in America is already dead from COVID-19 in just less than two and a half years. I don't know if you all remember when President Biden shocked the nation by saying that uh, it was one in a thousand black individuals that had died of COVID-19. It's already quadrupled since then. And uh, for indigenous communities, as you can see here, it's even worse with perhaps one in 180 individuals already dead from COVID-19. And in reality, the number may be uh, even higher than that, maybe as high as one in 134 uh, when you correct beyond age adjustments for chronic underreporting for this particular community. So across all indicators of health, no matter what you're talking about, um, the black community, marginalized communities remain woefully underserved. Um, but some of you might be a little confused about what I'm talking about here. So, you know, the, the fact that I'm starting off a talk that's supposed to be focused on diversity and research participation, but here I am talking about um, discussing inequities in health, uh, you know, kind of health outcomes. Um, you might be thinking, well, sure, this is a problem, but these are entirely different issues, right? So why muddy the waters? Why, why confuse the issue by talking about these things um, like they're the same problem? Um, the argument that I wanna make over the next 30, 40 minutes, um, if we're lucky, <laughs> uh, is that there may be two symptoms of a common set of underlying problems here. The emergence of so so socially and societally driven inequities uh, may be uh, not exactly a modern phenomenon, um, but with all medical matters, you know, we really need to try to do our work in understanding the history of these uh, to really understand the, the context that drives uh, their persistence to the present day. So very, very briefly, I promise this will be brief, we're gonna go back and we're gonna talk, talk about some of the hard truths when it comes to uh, past <clears throat> medical abuses. I promise we're gonna do this fast because if we don't, we're gonna be here all day. Um, according to, to writer and scholar and one of my favorite authors, Harriet Washington, the emergence of health inequities, um, which masqueraded as disparities, um, was partially root, rooted in uh, 17th to 19th century medicine, um, 
practiced on these populations in the United States. So there were rich white uh, uh, slave owners um, that they could, uh, they were able to withstand things like, uh, like bloodletting, which you can see here. Um, they can also withstand things like trepanation. Uh, these procedures were often pretty deadly for overworked and malnourished enslaved Africans. Uh, early American doctors mistook these differences in health outcomes for inherent racial, racialized differences. And even, you know, American founding father Thomas Jefferson himself said, never bleed a Negro. Now, it's really important that you remember that the side of privilege not only won't, but sometimes absolutely cannot understand the side of disadvantage. So even when they're well-intentioned, uh, as Jefferson's quote was supposed to be, too often, the privileged few simply miss the point entirely. So here's what I mean. Let's talk briefly about the history of exploitative academic medicine, the response, and ask ourselves whether we're still missing something fundamental about clinical research and clinical care. <clears throat> All right, so here we go. <laughs> um, in, in years past, I have dedicated uh, a full hour and change to these historical abuses, but unfortunately, I'm really, really pressed for time. So we're gonna have a quick recap of some of these historical abuses that set up the kind of environment that many of us work in today. So we're gonna start with uh, Louisiana physician, Samuel Cartwright, who coined the term uh, uh, drepetomania and dysesthesia Ethiopica, which were so-called mental illnesses that drove enslaved Africans uh, to be lazy and to flee captivity. Of course, the most effective treatment for these maladies was excessively hard outdoor labor, beatings, and sometimes cutting the toes off of each foot. <clears throat> There's also Marion Sims, who is a physician who perfected a technique to repair uh, prolapsed uteruses, ushering in an, an entirely new era of women's health. However, that perfection came at the cost of dozens of enslaved women uh, who not only repeatedly faced surgery without available anesthetic, they were forced to hold each other down because Dr. Sims' colleagues got a little too squeamish. Um, in 1915, Dr. Joseph Goldberger induced pellagra in a dozen black prisoners in Mississippi to win a bet. In 1927, hospital workers in Lyle Station, Indiana, exposed the heads of 10 black children to radiation to study, to study its effects, including five-year-old Hardis Vertiman. Excuse me, Vertis Hardiman. Um, there were already human research protections in place from the American Medical Association and the Atomic Energy Commission and, uh, that should have prevented this, but it didn't. They didn't save Vertis. They didn't save hundreds of black children across 40 years. Now, I want you to think about that for just one moment. What were these human research protection policies intended to achieve, if not preventing children from being deceived and tortured? Now, there are terms like idiot and moron and imbecile. Um, they're not just for Twitter. Uh, they were coined by the medical establishment in the early 20th century to destabilize black activism and force targeted victims to be sterilized or institutionalized. Mm -hmm. In the 1940s, Ab Cade was a truck driver working on the Manhattan Project. Uh, he was plucked from a car accident, injected with plutonium, had 15 teeth pulled and escaped before doctors could do more to trigger multiple cancers in his body. In 1951, Henrietta Lacks had her cells harvested without permission by George Guy, both before and after her death. This led to a chain of events so exploitative and abusive that her family were still being actively harassed and harmed uh, until right about a decade ago. Uh, Dr. Eugene Sanger forged consent documents from 150 black folks to study radiation, killed 84 of those within a matter of a couple of months, and then justified his selection by saying that the victims, quote, didn't have any money and they're black. Not to be outdone, Dr. Chester Southam did the same thing with 22 bedbound and elderly black women who had no opportunity to protest. In 1972, Boston doctors performed unnecessary and unwelcome hysterectomies on black patients for the purposes of training their students. They were only stopped by medical residents who rose up and said enough. In the 1970, researchers at John Hopkins tested the blood of 7,000 black children to look for a biological predisposition uh, to crime. In 1997, they asked the same question at Columbia University, excluding white children in a fully approved IRB application and administered fenfluramine to 126 black boys under the age of 10. In 1990, the Centers for Disease Control injected 1,500 black and Latinx babies in Los Angeles with an experimental measles vaccine that was associated with an increased mortality in children in three other countries. Of course, we already know about the egregious horrors of the Tuskegee syphilis, syphilis study, but how many of you are just as fluent, uh, fluent with the US-led uh, uh, Guatemala inoculation experiments? 
which involved 1,500 Guatemalans who were deliberately infected with syphilis, gonorrhea, and other uh, sexually in, uh, transmitted infections over a three-year span. And so in total, these atrocities were so systematic, they were so blatantly effective uh, that at the Nuremberg trials, little actual Nazis justified their own horrific abuses by claiming that they were more ethical than American doctors of the 20th century. So y'all just let that sink in. The Nazis saw folks like us sitting in this room today and they thought we had crossed the line, the Nazis. So just let that sink in and imagine how far we would have had to come for that to no longer be the case. So there are themes here. There are lots of through lines um, that we haven't really addressed. How many of you noticed that as we got to more contemporary and current uh, violations, we tended to start referring to institutions rather than individuals? That suggests that these, uh, these abuses didn't go away, that they've just become more systematized. Despite our best efforts, how did we get to this point though? So let's take a look at, at some of the, the policies that proliferated in the years after these abuses by starting with the, the big one, uh, the Belmont Report. Um, you know, this was obviously the US's response to the Tuskegee syphilis study. The Belmont Commission was created in 1974 and a final report was published in 1979. The recommendations were accepted in their entirety and over the next few decades, most federal agencies adopted this as a set of human research protections in some form or fashion. Uh, these principles guide every aspect of human research to this day, and the way the story goes, put a quick end to all those medical abuses. That's at least what we're told when we do our city recertification, right? Um, we tried to eliminate the racism and the abuse. But we already know that this isn't the way the story goes, and that's because a lot of those abuses happened after 1979 that I just told you about. Um, not only did the Belmont Report really fail to prevent institution and systemic harms as effectively as individualized ones, um, but now we're really faced with a lot of these historic inequities that brought us in this room today. Um, we, we don't have that representation of research participation that we all crave. Why is that? These recommendations, you know, they seem pretty solid. Respect for persons, beneficence, justice. It seems like a, you know, all you really need to, in order to get this right. So where did we go wrong? And this is where I know you might be feeling a little bit sleepy, really have to pay attention because there's a very subtle point that I'm trying to articulate here. Let's walk, start with a, a clip from a 1993 PBS special on the Tuskegee study, um, which is gonna maybe help us understand a little bit about what we've overlooked. So actually, I thought that was a pretty illuminating clip. It was, it was sort of talking about the civil rights movements in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, and they, they mentioned that the scientists sort of watched and waited. They failed to sort of take these seismic uh, social activities into context. And the more I talk, the more it sounds like what has happened since 2020 uh, in our own backyards. Um, the more things change, the more they, they really stay the same. But, but the, the question that I'm asking you is not to think about whether or not the Tuskegee researchers were racist. That's not the question. Of course they were racist. They were super racist. What I'm asking you though, is what is it about the scientific enterprise that allows that racism to become so entrenched and so embedded in the work that they did and the work that we do today? Did we solve that problem with the Belmont recommendations? So I've got another clip from you from that same program. Um, you know, it, it features one of the Tuskegee study doctors uh, that may help us answer this question. Okay, so um, just, just for the record, I think we can agree that that dude sucks. Uh, so John Cutler, uh, you can look him up. He's got a very brief Wikipedia page, but it, it reads like a straight up super villain. This guy, guy was nasty. Jonathan, sorry, yes. quick thing. Do you have more video clips? Because I think the online participants can't hear yeah. and I think I just have to edit one. Like, oh, um, I've got one more okay. uh, video clip. Do you, you mind need to make if a quick change? Take, sure. Take a second. Yeah. 
Sorry, folks online. I am fixing that now. I was wondering why the comments were coming in. I thought people yeah, just really liked my talk. Really <laughs> like so, share sound. I should have done this earlier. Okay. And uh, optimize yeah. for video clips. All right. Let's do this again. All right. So uh, maybe we can start with that last um, clip one more time. Okay. The, this one? Uh, no, no, no. This the, one. This, yeah, we'll just do that. All right, and let me just. Okay, let's test okay. this out. One of the few surviving public health service doctors who worked on the study still defends that decision. John. Okay, Cutler. great. It was important. They were and they supposedly like untreated, and uh, it would be undesirable to go ahead and use large amounts of penicillin to treat another disease because you'd interfere with uh, the study. Okay, all right, so it's really, really important that we all heard um, uh, that, that quote, because I think the rest of the talk really hinges on the excuse that he offered. Now, again, it's easy to say that dude was awful, he was just a villain, he was just making stuff up, but maybe the deeper problem, the deeper problem that we haven't really addressed is in how research was being conducted at the time, particularly with regards to the way that it profits off of highly convenient easily accessed samples. If that tendency becomes a corrupting influence, then we have to ask the question, did the Belmont Report and its flurry of recommendations address that problem? Did it address that challenge? So, so ultimately what that means is, yes, we, we tried to eliminate the racism and the abuse with, with these, with these uh, recommendations from the Belmont Report, but did we try to change the motivations of researchers did we try to change the structure of research itself? Did we try to really bring justice into the picture for communities as well as individuals? So ultimately, it seems that the Belmont Commission put together a lot of really excellent recommendations to prevent abuses like Tuskegee from ever happening again. Uh, but the commission may have failed to truly solve one of the problems that they identified, which is justice. You know, this report and, and many additional measures by federal agencies over the next 25 years made it clear that people of color were to be treated with different rules, which meant that many medical researchers either didn't know how to reach communities that look like mine, or they just didn't care to try. So the Belmont Report, like so many protections that came before it, really was designed to solve one problem at the cost of creating several others. It turns out that that becomes a theme for federal guidance on clinical research in the years after the Belmont Report. So why did all of these policies also fail? Um, there have been over 30 policies since 1977 that are all targeted on trying to reach more diverse uh, and representative populations. It seems that um, you know, there are about 35 policies in a 45 year period, uh, and clearly they're not working. Otherwise there wouldn't be quite so many of them, right? Um, so why, why do we need so many attempts to try to get this? I think that what we need to do is we have to go back and ask that same question. What is it about the scientific enterprise that allows racism to become so entrenched and embedded in our work? And did we solve that problem with the Belmont recommendations? Did we solve that problem with the common rule? In my opinion, I think we didn't address that convenience factor. Marginalized groups were, were convenient to recruit from. We made some changes and we now created a new convenient group to recruit from, very privileged populations. And it becomes easier for us as a clinical researchers because that's the population that we're also trying to generalize to. So it becomes convenient to exclude marginalized groups under the current framework. But we haven't addressed the problem of of really pushing clinical researchers to pursue um, uh, convenient, very, very highly convenient samples in order to conduct their research. And so what is the cost of that? And I wanna walk you through some examples um, that are a little bit complicated, but that kind of get into um, some of these, these challenges. Um, we're gonna do one last video clip that talks about uh, these challenges in a way that I think everybody recognizes. And then we're gonna get into some of the subtler details of that cost of exclusion. In a lot of ways, Sims epitomizes the story of American medicine for black women. It's a system that's failing them to this day. From infant mortality to life expectancy, the racial disparities in healthcare are staggering. 
The gulf between black and white might be widest when we look at maternal mortality, with black women three to four times more likely to die in connection with pregnancy or birth than white women. And that divide can be traced back to doctors like Sims, who contributed to a long, largely overlooked history of institutional racism in medicine. Trying to understand a historical problem without knowing its history is like trying to treat a patient without eliciting a thorough medical history. You're doomed to failure. That is uh, Harriet Washington who wrote the excellent book, Medical Apartheid. Um, I hire, highly encourage everybody to, to give it a read. Uh, it is a tough read, but it is a really, really necessary and vital one. Uh, but the history that, that, uh, that, that Ms. Washington is talking about um, really echoes to the present and beyond well-documented issues like maternal mortality. So let's walk through an example from the phase three clinical trials on the drug now known as Adjuhelm, uh, which has been uh, approved uh, by FDA uh, to, to, to treat dementia. I am sure, I am so sure that many of you know a whole lot about uh, the controversies around Adjuhelm with uh, folks like Harley Fernandez Lynch and J Jason Carlowish, um, leading uh, many vital national conversations on the many, many, many shortcomings of this drug and of the, the approval process. But, but within that conversation are a couple of points that often go unconnected. And so I want you to walk with me uh, through just a little bit of a journey here. So here we've got the, the Adjuhelm enrollment data from uh, the, the two trials, Emerge and Engage, uh, which were identical, um, as reported by professors uh, Jennifer Manley and Maria Gleemore. And yes, you, you have to put respect on those names, so call them professor. Um, there are a few things here that are worth touching on before we, we dive into the substantive point of this particular pie chart. First, the overwhelming representation of white folks. Nearly 90% of the 3,300 individuals in this trial um, for a pair of studies that were run uh, in 20 countries. With white people as only 16% of the global uh, population, you've really got to wonder what it is that we're doing here, what it is that we're trying to solve. With, with representation that looks like this. But the lack of diversity doesn't really stop here. The, the vast majority of the small slice of red, the Asian participants, were recruited in Japan, which doesn't tell us much about this category in Asia or in Asian descended individuals in the United States, because 94% of the Asian individuals uh, were recruited from abroad. And then you might have noticed that there's six categories here in the legend. Um, but if you can squint, you can only maybe see three or four. Uh, that's because there was only one individual who identified as American Indian and one individual who identified as a Pacific Islander. 3,385 participants, 348 sites in 20 countries, just one of each. But we're really here to take a look at those black individuals in the study. So this green slice is about one half of 1% which gosh, that is really low by any metric. Now, wh whether you're defining representativeness by census data or, or burden of the disease, we can agree that that is just, it's just way too low. But there's an additional wrinkle here, and that's how we re reconcile black identity with APOE status. Now let's step over to the APOE data really, really quickly. Um, so here are the data from those same trials broken down by APOE four characters. For those of you who aren't steeped in the world of Alzheimer's disease, uh, this E4 allele is really thought to confer some sort of additional risk uh, for, for Alzheimer's. So E4 carriers are really highly sought after in AD trials. And in fact, E4 carriers made up around 70% of the participants in the Emerge and Engage trials. But what was discovered is that carrying that allele uh, in these trials made in participants more vulnerable to edema and microhemorrhages. Um, so I put up the edema data here, but it really doesn't matter how you slice it. Um, having these E4 alleles means that a significantly higher risk of these not so great things happening in your brain. Not great to, to have an E4 allele and be a part of this trial. So it, it look at these data, in the highest dose, we are approaching half of all participants with, with some of these issues uh, over the course of a, of a trial. So it looks like E4 carriers are at some significant risk uh, with this Adjuhelm drug. But here's the question who tends to have the highest rate of E4 status. Let's take a look, but I bet you can guess based on my disappointed yet smug expression. <laughs> so ding, 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 that is right. Black individuals are more than 50% more likely to have an E4 allele compared to white or Latinx people. But hang on a second. These data might be giving you some mixed feelings. On one hand, holy cow, does this mean Adjuhelm might cause more of these edemas and microhemorrhages in Black people? On the other hand, 
house a population at higher risk of Alzheimer's disease, a group 50% more likely to have E4 alleles, how are they only one half of 1% of two major clinical trials on Alzheimer's? And so this is what I mean by solving the problem of convenient sampling in clinical research. We have historic racism, systemic exclusion, all conspiring to put high risk groups uh, at the fundamentally unknown additional risk. So might it, the risk be higher in this population? <clears throat> Maybe. ApoE in, in Black people is a little bit different than it is in, in other populations because of some complex interactions with other genes like ABCA7, but it really boils down to the same thing. We just don't know. We can't know because despite having every scientific incentive to recruit Black folks into this trials, uh, people who look like me just weren't convenient enough. We didn't solve for the context justifying research, racism and research, and now uh, the consequence are that not only do we, we fail to understand what's going on with Adjuham and Black folks, there's a really a good chance that we may have missed something fundamental about Alzheimer's disease itself. So that's enough for our foray into these data. I will get to your question in just one minute, ma'am. Let's get back to policy. Um, what on earth can we do about this mess that we're in? But before I get into that, what is your question? So my question was, what is the denominator for the Blacks? Because since you said there's such a tiny, teeny fraction of the participants in the trials, that was- So this is not, this is taken from, this is taken from a uh, community-based sample back in 1998. This is not from the eMERGE or ENGAGE data. Um, these so, are from good size sample from samples. Yeah, so these are from some yeah. huge, huge samples, um, okay. huge national samples. Got it. Uh, the previous data were from the trials. This is not from the okay. trials. So this is just looking at the base rate of E4. Okay, all right. So what can we do from like a policy standpoint? That's kind of what I'm supposed to be here about, right? Um, so uh, what we have here is a recent uh, consensus study report published by uh, the National Academies. Uh, that looked at improving representation in clinical trials research. Um, so I just wanted to quickly note uh, that I served on this committee through um, last June, I quit about a year ago. Happy to talk about why, um, but I wasn't necessarily a part of the, the, the development of the final report here. So ultimately there are a lot of really interesting um, uh, points that were made in this, in this report. I think it was really, really great. It's a bit of a long read, um, but I promised everybody in the committee that I would read it cover to cover and I have twice. Um, so, Ultimately, the, the, the points are that the lack of representation has lots of negative consequences when it comes to this work. Um, they use this really, really creative approach called the future elderly model um, to predict or anticipate some element of savings. And they found that even with a 1% improvement in disparate outcomes in just two diseases, the savings um, to, to American taxpayers into our healthcare systems is about 100 billion. Um, and that's just for diabetes and heart disease alone. So 1% reduction and the existing uh, health disparities uh, creates an, uh, just an enormous economic benefit. Um, there are lots and lots of limits to generalizability, and I'll get into that into my, uh, my talk tomorrow, but there are also clear limits to scientific innovation. The fact that we don't have representative samples holds back the quality of the science that we're able to, to conduct. And we kind of come back to this apparent contradiction in policy, uh, where you, you, you have agencies that are certainly hope to improve diverse participation and inclusion, yet, those, uh, what you see is, is sort of talking out of both sides of their mouth. Uh, these same agencies tried to imp improve protections for individuals that may be uh, formally or perhaps informally de defined as exploited or vulnerable. So there are clear policies for the protections of some of these groups, um, but there's not necessarily a clear, strong policy guidance on their inclusion in research uh, uh, opportunities. One of the really significant problems is the missingness of the data. Uh, sexual and gender minorities, for example, um, have barely any uh, uh, peer-reviewed research on their inclusion, participation in, in uh, clinical trials. Uh, and uh, the report goes to some lengths to, to particularly criticize FDA uh, for their lack of action. Uh, they said that I think every single policy that FDA has come up with has come um, uh, because of external pressure, usually from Congress. And uh, there is uh, no sort of leadership in that particular space. Now, there are lots and lots of other kinds of barriers um, that, uh, that are detailed, um, and I will talk about a lot of those tomorrow. Um, but, but ultimately, there are, some, there are three clear, key points. Um, individual and community barriers to research are misrepresented. They tend to be institutional and research uh, study sample uh, problems. Uh, a lot of these barriers really stem from research teams uh, rather than individuals. Um, and trust is a big factor, but it doesn't affect willingness to participate in research. 
In fact, the biggest determining factor of participating in clinical trials, especially for minor, marginalized and minoritized populations, is simply being asked. Uh, and we've actually found that uh, in, in my own data that I'll be presenting uh, a little bit on tomorrow. So the recommendations from this report, um, I, again, I thought were really, really great. Um, they are really attuned to, to systemic needs because uh, I think all of us have really strong intentions um, around trying to do this right, but we are really limited in terms of time, resources, and tools. Uh, so there are, there are lots of calls to improve the fidelity of reporting, um, better approaches to, to remuneration. Um, so uh, uh, Holly Fernandez-Lynch and Emily Largent uh, uh, basically have half a chapter dedicated to their 2017 paper uh, about how we can compensate participants. Um, and ultimately, they call for allowing differential compensation based on some sort of hardship or burden. The, the fact is that people should not have to go out of pocket uh, in order to participate in a clinical research study. And, that, and unfortunately, that is effectively what we're asking people to do. There are naturally calls to improve the infrastructure and workforce, um, particularly to uh, make it possible to uh, improve diversity for, for leaders uh, and to provide uh, training and promotion incentives. So there, there, is, uh, there are ways to, to make diversity easier, but it tends to be uh, uh, necessary to create some sort of systemic infrastructure to make that possible. So my, my, my take is that I think these are all really solid recommendations. Um, however, I do think that there is a chance that they may create new challenges um, that are currently not necessarily well documented. Uh, there is a really significant risk, even if we implement all of the recommendations, uh, for substandard quantification of representation, which means we won't necessarily do a good job of capturing that diversity within diversity. And that will mean that uh, if we are continue to compare different groups with differential recruitment, we'll end up um, trying to compare apples and oranges. Uh, we won't necessarily know that that's what we're doing. So that my, uh, my, my thought here is what if we could go further here? What if we could do a little bit more? Um, what does that look like? So one thing that the report doesn't mention is that there are lots of tools to actually correct for these problems that currently exist and can be implemented at the researcher level. The best ones are gonna need lots of resources, of course. Um, and obviously we need better integration and of marginalized voices at all levels of study design uh, and much more robust efforts when it comes to recruitment, engagement and retention. But we can think about uh, things like uh, alternatives to, to RCT design. We can think about uh, modified uh, versions of RCTs, like a, cohort, like a cohort multiple RCT design. We can think about uh, uh, pragmatic clinical trials, in of one designs, smart and equipoise uh, implementations. There is a, a wide world of innovation and flexibility when we design our scientific studies that make it possible to be more inclusive from the get-go. Uh, we can think a little bit more about the way we analyze our data. Um, such as uh, trying to work closely with DSMBs uh, to, to, to look at some aspects of representativeness um, when they're doing their, their analyses, especially futility analyses. Um, we can also start to leverage things like G-estimation and inverse probability weighting within our models to try to correct for a lack of representation if we have no methods to rectify it uh, uh, you know, sort of naturally. And then ultimately, this is my own little personal soapbox that I hope you'll kind of permit me. We, we really got to move beyond null hypothesis significant testing. We've got to move past central tendency. We know that so many of these populations live and die on the margins, and we just don't see them when we're looking at means and medians. We start looking at measures of uh, dispersion, uh, measures of distributional uh, characteristics. We are much more likely to capture those individuals um, that, that sort of aren't within our, our narrow scope of looking at measures of central tendency. Um, the other thing that I think is really, really necessary is to focus on, on balancing those risks of exclusion. Um, we also, we often talk about these protections of, of research participation, um, but ultimately it's only one side of the equation. It's looking about those risks and managing those risks of being included in this research study. We are not necessarily looking at the risks of being excluded, which is why and how we have allowed a lot of these health inequities to proliferate over time. So in order to actually ask and answer that question, we have to consider new models of data ownership and, and access and licensing data. Uh, we have to think about um, you know, moving uh, institutional review boards into local communities. Um, we need to have broad definitions of what it means to participate in research um, and to have uh, expertise in these, in these particular settings. So it's, not, it's more than just a study team and a research participant, but there are lots of additional stakeholders that can be reliably engaged in our study designs to help us mitigate, or at the very least quantify, uh, risks of, of exclusion. Now, one of the, the oversights from the report is that they didn't really discuss bioethics. They talked a lot about policy, 
but they, there wasn't a lot of discussion about the evolution of bioethical theory around research participation that may drive some of these discussions. But one thing um, that I, I think is, is also needed is to make sure that we discuss these with a, with a kind of a systems or intersectional approach. So what this does is kind of brings me to, to kind of the, the central point of this talk, which is what if lack of diversity isn't the whole problem? There may be fundamental limits to the way that we are typically conducting research. And part of the tension that we're feeling at this moment in time is we're bumping up against that upper limit of what we can do with the kinds of trials that we've designed now. So diversity, uh, my prediction is that if we implement the recommendations of the report, we will probably have some diversity and it will come at the cost of inclusion. Uh, if that sounds like gobbledygook, I can promise I can, I can talk you through that uh, during the Q&A period. Um, but ultimately, I think that the diversity problems may be symptomatic of larger shortcomings uh, and that we may need to have an operationalized approach to justice for these elegant solutions. <clears throat> so it's hard, right? It's really, really hard to operationalize justice. Like, what do we even do? But I really have to ask what we have now. Does that sound like justice? Is that justice? Mm -hmm. You know, is that a fair distribution of costs and benefits? Are we fully compliant with the spirit of our own flawed principles on clinical research? Whatever your answer to that question, that feeling that you have now, that's a starting point. And I just know that the Cold War that we're currently waging against marginalized, minoritized communities, that's not working. That's not justice. So we can do better. We can do more. So ultimately, my cheesy point is we're not the heroes that we're waiting on, but we're here. And uh, I've got a couple of ideas that, that can help. And so let's, let's talk through some of those. Um, if I can actually, what is that? I think you just need to click away from it. I need to click away from uh, it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, that's ridiculous. How does that happen? Okay. All right, here we go. There we go. Okay, so um, a couple of years ago, my colleagues, uh, Andrea Gilmore Bikowski and Quinsuilo Wilkins, and I uh, wrote a piece for Trends in Molecular Medicine. Uh, actually, we wrote it for a lot of places, but nobody was interested in publishing it. But uh, this article is, is a really quick and easy read. You can read it in, in just about 15 minutes. Uh, it lays out a lot of groundwork for how we can accomplish justice in research. And there's, there's a lot of things that we can do here. So we lay out six main principles of research justice. So first, we really write on the importance of data fidelity, strengthening regulations around reporting compliance and transparency, um, because you know, if we can't see the scale and the scope of our, our continual under-inclusion, we really can't address it. We also need to be uh, very careful in rooting out systemic discrimination and racism from our research. Uh, we often tell ourselves that because science is objective, so too must we be. Um, but it's really the other way around, right? So because we are biased, so too must our science be. So we have to make sure that our assessments and measures aren't validated on highly biased samples, or if they are, that we have implemented some sort of corrective measures uh, to, to mitigate the impact of that bias. Um, so that we, we really have to take a hard look at practices that, that we don't even question, like a de facto English language requirement, um, you know, making sure that people can participate in research on bankers' hours, um, you know, and, and sort of recognizing that there are lots of regulations and recommendations participation that we're ultimately ignoring, uh, like, uh, like plain language requirements that have been put in place long ago by DHHS. Um, we also have to make sure that we work to move beyond proportional representation and uh, really end this, this sort of straw man idea that achieving representation uh, at rates that match the US population is sufficient, it's not. Um, and uh, we'll get into talking about whites um, as a referent group in just a moment. Uh, but the, the other elements of justice in research really means that we have to think about building uh, reciprocal, mutually beneficial relationships with uh, any and all communities that, we, that we're, we're trying to welcome into research spaces. Um, and, and ultimately, the, the bottom line there is that we have to be willing to give up some power and create accountability. Uh, we can include participants, uh, not just as patient and community advisors, but as equal partners in designing and defining research questions and outcomes, in designing what that workflow of recruitment, engagement, and retention looks like. Uh, we can start to operationalize participant um, experience surveys and metrics in the same way that we do for our clinical patients, just as, as one idea. Uh, and then ultimately, we, we, you know, instead of lamenting mistrust, uh, we, we really need to work hard on becoming trustworthy. Um, it's really important to develop like a key sciences of uh, research participation and inclusion. Um, and, and ultimately, we really have to start developing both in a basic and applied science of how to do this, this stuff right. Um, and, and we also need to show the harms of doing it wrong. Um, 
That really starts with the key admission though. We, we, we have to recognize that we as clinical researchers uh, in most cases don't really know how to achieve sustainable research uh, and much less do so with a representative population. We just gotta admit that uh, right off the bat. Um, but what we can really get started right now today is to recognize that the bright line that we've always drawn between uh, healthcare and clinical research doesn't exist when it comes to talking about health inequities. We're still trapped in this era of scientific racism. Um, and it's really manifested when we start to confuse our own systemic policies for essentialized differences between us and them. Now, the only way to really truly honor that third pillar of justice, which we all claim that we regularly affirm, is to ensure that we have an infrastructure that allows us to robustly differentiate between inequities and disparities. And if we can't do that, we are lost. And that is where we need to be really directing a lot of our energy. So allow me to introduce one way of creating that day, like uh, towards creating that daylight um, and, and, and try to help us understand what we mean when we're talking about this, this broader principle of health disparities. So justice really means reifying that term in a way that is operationalizable uh, within our research studies. So historically, all differences were, were kind of lumped into you know, this term. If there was a, a group difference, you assume that it was somehow essentialized or biological, that it was immutable. Uh, you know, men are from Mars or women are from Venus. Like it was just an inherent difference between these kinds of things. Um, nowadays, I, I think we, we recognize that while there may be some biological differences between groups, there are also lots of socialized and structural forces um, that, that may contribute to the differences that we're seeing here. Um, but, but what I think is actually going on is, is a little bit more complicated. Uh, and I think it looks a little bit more like this. And so this connects the work you know, that we see, that we recognize with domains where we as researchers have an, a, a, like some ability and responsibility to assess, model, and limit. Um, it's, a, it's a really cool uh, causal inference-based approach for inequities, for understanding inequities um, as a kind of compounded biasing factor. Uh, and that really helps us that, you know, to understand that we can use existing bias reduction tools in our science uh, to start to limit some of these, these contributions. And it also really helps us deconfound the underspecified field of what health equity or health, health disparities research actually is. So uh, I'm gonna just walk you through an example to kind of contextualize uh, what I'm talking about. Um, you know, with the work that we often talk about when it comes to health inequities is really mostly based on social and structural factors, biological disparities, uh, it touches a little bit uh, like, uh, about measurement error, um, but the work that I wanna talk about today and tomorrow, we'll really be focusing on, on biases and errors in selection measurement and implementation. <clears throat> So let's, let's talk a little very briefly about um, dementia risk as a way to kind of walk us through these dimensions if it doesn't quite click yet for you. Um, you know, historically, like I said before, what we thought of as racial differences to dementia were inherent. Uh, white people have some risk, black people just sort of have more, question mark. Um, but the reality is that the differences are really a whole lot more complex. So, so maybe, maybe there is that inherent difference. But before we come to that conclusion, we have to address things like selection bias. Uh, we have to address things like sensitivity analyses in our studies. So those who we are really bringing into our dementia research um, uh, and who, get to, who actually gets to do it, uh, which of course favors more privileged populations. So I've shown you plenty of examples that really kind of highlight that. But you know, beyond that, there may be differences in measurement bias in terms of the validity of dementia rating scales as they interact with cultures or, or, uh, uh, or presentations of dementia that are not well represented in research. Um, or, or maybe that we've even failed to capture what dementia looks like from the perspective of those who live with it. Um, you know, as is well understood by translational researchers, there's our implementation biases in terms of how people live with dementia and how they're brought into care environments and, and what that looks like uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, these, these implementations being fundamentally different um, in terms of the environment in which they were devised uh, versus where they are ultimately deployed. Um, you know, all of these variables really kind of interact and compound and poison the quality of the work that we're publishing. You know, there, there's variance at individual, institutional, and systemic levels purely within our studies, as you can see with the selection measurement implementation issues. Um, and we're basically throwing all of that chaos into our, our models as noise. So there's, this is dangerous. This is what we're doing right now is, is terribly dangerous um, because the harms that we are typically attributing to social forces uh, outside of our research environment are actually you know, coming from inside the house. So we as researchers need to really take care of all of that um, before we can lay the blame on these external factors 
or um, essentialize it or into, into in individuals specifically. Now, <clears throat> I'm starting to run short on time. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna skip ahead um, past like a discussion about reifying race um, as, a, as a variable. But the bottom line is that uh, you really should never be using race to differentiate groups in your research. Um, it's never doing the thing that you think it's doing. Um, it's just doing a bad job of, of serving as a proxy variable or some sort of construct or some sort of dimension reduction factor. Um, it's usually not even a great indicator of racism itself. Um, so, so ultimately, uh, you can also connect that with, with different models of clinical care. Um, but in the interest of time, I want to just kind of get into talking about specific ways of, of measuring and thinking about justice uh, in research. So moving from policy to action. Uh, so this is work that I'm doing with Ana Quinones, where we're looking at uh, embedded pragmatic clinical trials uh, and re-examining the Pressy's two framework that really guides line, that kind of guides, uh, gives structure on how pragmatic a trial is. Ultimately, uh, it is possible to propose some changes to this framework uh, that, that uh, allow you to um, think about equity and representation. And so the really great thing is that you don't have to change much about the framework at all. You just need to think about it um, at different dimensional uh, stakeholder groups. So you have the same nine, nine domains, but you think about implementing them at the organizational level, the team level, and the individual level. And making sure that your trial is, is perfectly pragmatic along all of those dimensions um, is a really great way of starting to design for uh, potential blind spots in health equity. Now, um, you can also, what's great is that there's also a proliferation of additional outcomes that you can um, really uh, uh, put into your models um, that, that does this work. Uh, other things that we've done are, are really cool, um, like, like working with the Michael J. Fox Foundation. So Bernadette Siddiqui, uh, Angie Sanchez, the Assistant Director of the Care Research Center, and Helen Hemley, the Program Manager at the Care Research Center, uh, worked together for about two years um, to change the way that we fund Parkinson's disease research. So we developed a, a new DEI funding mechanism that was really, really great. Um, there, there had to be a focus on uh, uh, characterizing an excluded population, reducing inequities. Um, you know, we evaluated the diversity of the leadership team at grant review, uh, but I mean, ultimately, you know, the, the question was, can a limited DEI focused grant really solve anything? You know, it can solve some of the problems, but is it going to sort of solve the, the overwhelming flow of grant dollars to other organizations? So what we actually did was we retrofitted their, their primary clinical research funding pipeline uh, to focus on matters of inequity um, at the grant application process at both levels of review and in ongoing grant funding. Um, and, and what has been really remarkable is um, just by focusing on questions of equity in the way that scientists is already, science is already conducted, you see a, a natural proliferation of diverse voices um, uh, and expertise um, being kind of brought um, by necessity into these research designs. Um, there are lots of other examples that I'm going to get into. I've clearly run out of time here. Uh, I wanted to quickly highlight work that I've been doing with Emily Largent and Rebecca Edelweyer um, about uh, when clinical trials stop early. Uh, there's usually not great communication in this process. People find out, uh, you know, on, on you know, Facebook or they find out on the news. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got a paper that is under revision, should be approved any day now um, uh, or accepted any day now that, that really pr provides some clear recommendations on providing detailed plans for not just individuals participating in clinical trials, uh, but also their families. Um, uh, and also some, some directions for, uh, for news outlets, um, for advocate groups, and for others uh, that are really involved in this space. Uh, ultimately, the last thing that I want to talk about is, uh, you know, the, the big question that you have to ask is, is, is a just science a better science? The answer is, of course it is. Um, and that there are some fundamental limits to the way that we, we conduct our science from this very colonialist frame. Um, so, so there may be a fundamental need to, to, to decolonize science. Uh, at its core in order to, to solve these issues because it adds a really important context to our, our pursuit of, of seeking truth uh, and fundamental uh, mechanisms. So, um, you know, ultimately, you know, it really takes the pressure off the ivory tower to build data sets that cover everyone if we can just sort of share the microphone every now and again. So um, ultimately, uh, this is my last slide. We, we have a fundamental need to restore and empower in order to try to, to bring justice into our research designs. That means elegant solutions to, to really, really hard questions. Um, but ultimately, you know, if we, can, if we can do a better science, 
um, together by, by sort of expanding the definitions of what it means to participate and what it means to benefit from research science, um, then, then we really stand a, a really strong chance, not just of doing the right thing because it is the moral argument, but by doing the right thing because it's a scientifically compelling argument. I really think that um, we are on the precipice of, uh, of a new revolution in the same way that we uh, reluctantly embraced biostatistical models back in the in the largely the 1960s and 1970s, I think you know starting to uh, design our research for for a really clear equity focus will add a dimensionality and serve as the tip of the spear for um, for future innovation. So I will stop there, and uh, I'm happy to kind of answer any questions with the time that we have left. Great, thank you, John. So I, I'll start with a question that you would, that you invited while we wait um, for folks in the room and on the chat, which is. You had mentioned that diversity will come at the cost of inclusion. Can you tell us a little bit more what you meant by that? Yes. Um, so, the, you know, when I usually give presentations, uh, there's a paper that I have cited in almost every talk in the last two and a half years. And I challenge myself not to present it for one talk, but I'm going to present it tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and so, there was a paper, a really great paper published um, by a group out of the University of Wisconsin Madison that looked at the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center data set. So this is one of our largest repositories of individuals living with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and what you see there is if you compare white individuals and black individuals um, in terms of how fast they are likely to progress from mild cognitive impairment to frank dementia, what you see in that data set is that white individuals progress at like twice the rate of blacks, which is the opposite of everything we know about dementia as a, as a function of race. Uh, and the reason why is because most of the white people that came into the NAC data set came from a memory clinic. And most of the black people came from a community sample. So you're not really comparing white people and black people on the same, on the same terms. You've got a high risk population, black individuals coming from a low risk setting. You've got a somewhat lower risk population, the white individuals coming from a high risk setting. And so if you were trying to compare white and black people, um, from this data set, you would conclude white people have a you know, significantly higher risk, but you have failed to take that context in consideration. And so ultimately, like I said earlier, you're comparing apples and oranges. So, so what I think is we're going to see a lot more of that probably in the next five to 10 years, uh, groups that are not truly comparable, and it's going to make everybody feel real frustrated about this whole diversity thing. But that's because we're not really solving what I think are the more fundamental problems. There is a question in the chat um, from Kristen who says, thank you. Um, what's your take on IRB's roles in improving representation and decolonization? Um, and I would add to that, you know, FDA's role to think about different stakeholders. Yes. Um, so at its heart, if we are going to embrace equity, that really means one thing, flexibility. We have to be more flexible with our research designs, with how we provide compens compensation remuneration, with how we conduct participation. Um, so if we're thinking about IRBs, one of the questions that I often get the most, because I do a lot of consultation, uh, is you know, we would love to do this. We would love to, to reach out to people using social media, but our IRB just won't let us do that. We would love to use text messages, but our IRB just won't let that happen. So recognizing that, um, that conversations with IRBs and IRBs themselves need to be part of an evolving process. Um, you know, consulting with, with bioethicists and health policy experts, uh, with, with you guys, basically, um, on how best to reach marginalized individuals. Because when we say, oh, you can't, you can't reach people that way, oh, you can't reimburse for dependent care, we're basically saying, you know, it is much more convenient, it's much easier to exclude you rather than to include you. Um, and so we have to really balance, like I said, those, those, uh, those risks of exclusion versus inclusion. Um, FDA, for its part, I think can do a whole lot. Um, if we just think about kind of like the one, two, three, four phase trial designs, um, I, I think this is listed in the, in the NASA report, um, but, but starting with phase 2B, let's say, starting with phase 2B, there should be, you know, an expectation of representative uh, enrollment in research uh, uh, studies. I think in the short term, you can incentivize that by saying that maybe they have preferential access to accelerated approval pathways if they achieve this. And if they don't, then they have to kind of take the slow way. Um, but, but ultimately, I think FDA can really set a, an expectation of, of, of justifying uh, exceptions to representative uh, research sampling rather than uh, just sort of accepting it on a face value. So I think that there are lots of carrots and sticks that you can wield on that. I would say carrots in the short term, uh, but then, you know, this should just be a kind of standard for, for science in the long term. Yes, Pat. Yes. Uh, really fantastic talk. Uh, I'm wondering how you think about measuring representativeness 
by participation to prevalence ratios? Do you think they have shortcomings? Are there better ways? Yeah, so, you know, I think that there's, there's kind of a shorter and a longer answer. Um, what I would say is in the short term for right now, we should try to get as close an idea of what it looks like um, to try to generalize to the population that's at highest risk for whatever disease that, that we're trying to um, that we're trying to address. Um, the, the medium term answer is that what that means is that table ones will need to become inferential rather than descriptive because we're going to be looking to, to match on multidimensional um, aspects of distributions rather than just sort of comparing you know education between black people and white people. Um, and then I think in the long term though, if we truly decolonize science and clinical research, uh, then it doesn't really matter. Um, so what you can do is you can say, we've got this population, uh, we are just trying to generalize to the people that we've collected, um, but with a fully decolonized approach to clinical research, the hope is that the tools and the resources and the infrastructure will be there so that everybody that needs to be representation, represented will have the opportunity to, to be represented. So that's the appeal of a decolonized approach, is that it sort of takes the pressure off to make sure that every single study that we do is fully representative and says, you know, we'll do the best that we can. But in the short to medium term, uh, I would say let's let's try to look at um, some measure of of prevalence and and try to to build a sampling frame that's based on that and and so I think that trying to match that should be the first question that we are asking and we should design our research studies you know whether we embrace pragmatic trials and our inner one designs based on how we can reach um, you know that uh, like a substantial unbiased uh, uh, percentage of that sort of you know full penetra full penetrance of, of prevalence. All right, well, we are we are out of time, um, but there are more questions in the chat, um, as well as lots of um, accolades and praise. So thank oh, you for a fantastic you. talk, yeah. and we will share these comments with you. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, if, if for those of you on the talk, um, if you want to reach out to me on Twitter, uh, I am at egaly, E-G-A-L-Y. E uh, I'm happy to engage over the next couple of days and answer any questions that might have missed in the chat, um, but I would love to discuss this more. Like I said, these are ideas that have just been rolling around in my head for two years, and I, I would love to talk about them with you. Great, thank, thank you. you.